What I remember about Jamie, honestly, is that he was always drawing, like from a very, very early age. So it's no surprise to me that he was involved in the arts. And I, this is a tidbit that some of you who are former students of his probably will not believe this, but it's true. I remember him clearly in the 70s drawing all the Kiss figures. Cause, cause, <laughs> right and could, because <laughs> yeah, yeah, we, we shared a bedroom true. we shared a bedroom well that's i'm just saying that's something you probably wouldn't remember but i always remember him drawing as as a young kid like always yeah incessantly so that hasn't changed no nope, no nope, it has not which, which truthfully i was always envious of that skill like he could draw very very well Okay, so that's interesting. So you talked about how that you both kind of grew up in this creative environment and that he drew very well and everything, but you both ended up in the art world. So what kind of specific experiences or dynamics or relationships in your family do you think ended up um, influencing the work that you're creating now? Well, I, I can say something that John and I were coaxed early on by my father, who was a writer, to photograph. He'd pay us a little something to be out in the hot, day uh, photographing things for his articles. And I think that really resonated with John early on. Yeah, that's, I would agree with that. I mean, we would, we would go out and I, like my father needed images of himself for his articles. And so I learned early on how to take pictures of a camera, but not, not very well. It was just kind of the sunny 16 rule, if you know what that is. And from those of you in my photo classes and, um, so that was my incentive. I'm like, I get to hang out with my dad and I also get money. Uh, yes, sign me up, right? And so so what was the other question then, Haley? I'm sorry, I'm circle back. Um, just like being brothers, how did that kind of affect the work that you guys created? Did it like, did you play off each other at all? Yeah, so my older brother actually was was an award-winning photographer at a young age, like, and 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 he's kind of not, he didn't continue that. But we had a dark room slash bathroom set up in our house at a young age as well that I remember mm -hmm. because that was magical. I mean, it was this thing that's like, what? You could, you know, I'm, you know, we're, there's an eight, there's, there's a five year age difference between myself and my older brother and a year and a half between Jamie and I. But um, I, yeah, I don't know. I mean, there was always, there was, we were never discouraged from pursuing the arts in a real way that other families are. I mean, I yeah. was, we were always coaxed to perhaps maybe try something else that was maybe a little bit easier way to make a living. Um, but, I, you know, we were I, always I agree, encouraged. Yeah, I would agree that uh, anything we wanted to explore, our parents were, were behind us financially with time. I mean, in high school, I was given half of our garage to do these huge boutiques that I was doing in high school because there was nowhere I could do them anywhere else. But I'd be out there in the winter, but they parked the car in, in the, the outside. And I, that was my studio. So they were very uh, supportive of our creative endeavors. That's wonderful. So both of you were really blessed to have parents that did. They let you pursue these creative yeah. um, ideas and things that you wanted to do. Do either of you have a specific moment um, that you can think of though where you thought like okay like this is the turning point this is what I really want to do for a career do either of you have a moment you can think of go Jamie <laughs> uh, no I don't have a specific moment I just know there was a culmination of it, several events uh, I think I've, if some of you have heard me talk about this before between junior high and high school my mother had, in a, unbeknownst to me, had submitted my drawings that I just did on my own for a program at that time uh, that was called uh, Young, what Masters. was it called? Young, Young Masters. Masters. And uh, I got, you had to submit to be accepted and I got accepted and that, you know, I was just always drawing for myself. I wasn't trying to be an artist. It was just something I did. And that I think was probably a good anchor forward and upward within the art, you know, world. Yeah, for me, if there was a punctuated moment, I don't know that I can say that there was because I don't think I knew any better. I, I think it was your brother, wasn't that the turning point? I think your older brother was just... Oh, you mean Richard? No. Possibly, <laughs> Possibly. yeah, I mean, you make a good point. For if, if you're talking about <laughs> prototypes, yeah, that's a good point. 
<laughs> no, I mean, I, I really, so I, I'm, and I like all, so here's the thing about my situation. I like all the arts and, and, and James, James and I were both in the same art program along with a lot of other people who do very, very well right now. Like Chris Young was always somebody who could draw well. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I was fortunate, I think, really to have a high school art teacher who really nurtured our interest. But I yeah, remember liking arts mm -hmm. from an early on. Like, I, I, I think, honestly, for me, my main interest as a direct art, as artist, as you know, the art, art um, canon, if you will, I had a good high school art teacher that that really introduced me to artists that I still love today, like Severo Dali, and just the thought process. I know that a lot of people love or hate him, but I, as a you know, twelve year old kid, I was fascinated by him, just loved him. And anyway, so I, I don't know if there's a punctuated moment. I don't think Very so. Cool. It just evolved. Oh, there are those questions. Uh huh. Okay, so I think now we're gonna take some look at John's work. Okay, John, and I'll be your, uh, I'll be the slide forward guy. So okay. you just kind of wink with so, your left eye at me. So what are we showing first? Well, I put him somewhat in chronological order or in the order that you sent them to me. So your recent work will be at the end. Okay, all right, all right. Okay. So um, the, the work I think that you're going to see, if I'm not mistaken, is kind of an evolution of where I've been with some commercial work that I, I that kind of, um, so, so for those of you who don't know, my main interest is always balanced between fine art and commercial work. And I like to bridge the gaps, if you will. I know a lot of people think there's a big delineation, but, but in my canon of photography, my heroes were recontextualized and decontextualized based upon certain works that um, might give new information as to where that actually is. Um, in this case, this specific image was at the Woodbury without all the graphics around it. This was a piece that was designed directly for the Yamoka um, Museum up in Salt Lake for a benefit. So that has one purpose and void of the context, it, it changes meaning. Right, so if I take the same image as I have and put it into um, the, the uh, Woodbury Museum, it has different meaning, right? So that fascinates me in my wor world of art. Um, same different piece for, or different image for the same promotion, if you will. So, I, my you know my commercial world is very polished, but I've always balanced between the fine art. Um, so I do projects that are for me and also for clients, if that makes sense. So this was a project for me that ended up being used for um, Utah Valley University to promote their, um, it, it's, it's for faculty convocation. So, you know, again, speaking about context and recontextualizing things, it serves a different purpose. Um, wink, next slide. Same group of imagery for the same purpose. Um, this was an offshoot, though, that was me recontextualizing space. I, I try to challenge myself frequently for things that I'm not comfortable with because I don't think I'm good at. So I've never viewed myself as a landscape photographer because typically when you say landscape photography, there's images of Ansel Adams and so on and so forth, which don't interest me. I like to recontextualize space and see how I can do something different to add new meaning. This is a campaign I did specifically for Nike, and, and most of the, my career has been involved with commercial work. Um, this was uh, another thing with Nike Plus, which was a collaboration with Apple and Nike, um, another image from that. So that's kind of a foray into the commercial world. I've made a pronounced movement though, recently in the past couple of years to do work that's a little bit more just for me and for me alone, just to be selfish. Um, and, and I'm my only client that I have to appease, which is unusual for the history that I've had. Um, this was a personal work that had no boundaries based upon the work they've seen. It's very polished, very slick, and it has a purpose. It's to sell you things that you probably don't need, but I will, I will do that. Um, and so this is work that I've done in collaboration with um, 
a, a really fantastic friend of mine. Her name is Brittany Trochet. She is a um, hair and makeup educator and she's fantastic for Paul Mitchell uh, and, and she's amazing. She, she does awesome, awesome work. So whenever possible, I collaborate with her and we get together just to do things for ourselves to be selfish, to build our portfolios, not dissimilar from what you do as a student. Um, so we kind of give ourselves self assignments so that we can just grow and feel good about doing work. For me, I hate stagnation more than anything. If, if, if I feel stagnant, I, I get antsy and irritable. So this is the That's new work. Cool. No I one's right there and ask you a question kind yeah, of about that absolutely. because I think it's really interesting how you're talking about the different motivators that you have how like you know in some cases the client job is the motivator you know making the money but other times pushing yourself or trying these landscapes and so I guess what advice would you have for people who either feel like they're stuck in a rut or want to get better and aren't really sure how like what is giving you that drive <laughs> Yeah, well, and I think you probably know this too, Hilly, because you're in the same situation, right? Like with your with your lettering and your in your illustration. But um, for me, I again, I just get irritable if I'm not doing something that um, is investigative and makes me happy. And fortunately, I've had really amazing clients that allow me to have my brain trusts as a part of the project. Which I, I, I the more and more I talk to other image makers, the more I realize that I've been afforded a great opportunity that other people have not. So um, what drives me in terms of doing my own personal projects and doing work that then reinforms my commercial work, I think that's a pretty common thing for people who are involved in my world. The other aspect that I really like is installations and I also play around with music. I'm not very good at it, but I love doing it right? Like, um, I'm sure some of you have know Steve Astana and whatnot. He and I have dabbled in music together. He's, he's super talented. Um, and he's, he's much better at it than I am. But I think all of those things that are creative outlets kind of reinform all aspects of your creative process. So um, what drives me is it, it's what interests me, right? I, I like I, when I, when I look at artwork, I look at painters because it's unbound. So this new work is specifically echoing the, the painterly works that, oh um, you know, Im impressionist will, will emulate and um, abstract expressionism. Uh, so, so that's what that work, the new work that I'm doing is attempting to go back to some of my roots where I, I used to paint pretty frequently. Um, so now I'm doing it differently within a different medium, I'm actually creating these spaces that don't, you, you don't find those in photography. I, I've created all this. And so the only thing that they're um, frozen by is the camera. So it's an act of painting, but it's recorded by camera. So anyway, I'm getting back to that sort of notion of the camera is more of a recording device versus what it typically is used for like it's typically used for creating something that's solely within the photographic realm here i'm trying to bridge those barriers between painting and photography i know that wasn't the question you asked but that's what i'm that's what i'm attempting to do with this new work just to push myself in a new direction that i that i haven't been before and so anyway that's what this new work is about this is the first time anybody's seen it apart from one of the lecture that was last year during the COVID era so, so I'm creating these things. They don't exist. That is really cool. And yeah. so I guess this is kind of a different question, but this is actually for James. But from the brother's perspective, um, kind of how has John's work changed or been influenced um, from your perspective? You know, it's interesting. John, sense. I remember <laughs> in his uh, undergraduate work was really, and it was very tied to... Um, manual manipulation in the dark room uh yeah. you know and i mean this was pre-digital era and so he was doing some really paint you know it's interesting he circled back to now he's manipulating the images so they're very painterly well before he was actually literally painting in manipulating the negatives playing around with with uh chemicals directly on to, it was really uh, at the time he was he one semester i remember at byu he was 
enrolled in a class he thought he was enrolled in. And instead he was actually the teacher of this class because the methods that he was creating, do you remember that, John? True. Yeah, well, that's true. It, it was, uh, he was kind of breaking new ground with really manipulating uh, traditional media in more painterly, less commercial ways. And so the, the work he just shared is, is very reminiscent of that. They used to be very sapia tones. Uh, they weren't as colorful, but they were very much about manipulation and about texture and playing off of kind of an ethereal quality that we associate with, you know, hand-driven imagery. The interesting thing about those images is my teacher at the time told me multiple times and privately that I would never make any money doing the work that I was doing by manipulating those images. And those are the works that were the things that launched me into my commercial career. I never intended to be a commercial photographer, but when the likes of Starbucks um, and and Nike and um, Nordstrom paid attention to the work that uh, was was not well received from my professors, that's actually what segued me into becoming a fine artist into a commercial artist. But yeah, I'm trying to circle back around now to just seeing what's in my brain because I don't really know most of the time. I don't think any of us do. That's fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing that. So now we're going to change gears a little bit and look, James, or do you like to be called Jamie? I always just call you James. You know what? I, you, well, you can call me anything you want, but my friends call me Jamie. Uh, when I do things nationally, I'm James. I don't know why. It was maybe a persona shift, but it doesn't matter. I'm comfortable with either. So this is a work I've, I've kind of circled back around. John is, is kind of, you can see his progression. The way I've arranged mine is a little bit different. This was part of a show at Ars Morendi dealing with uh, death. It's a large triptych, but this really circles back around to work I was doing maybe 25 years ago in, a, in stylistically just black and white, large. Each of the can, uh, panels are about 40 by 60. And so I'm kind of all over the place. Uh, I will show you some work I was doing about eight, 10 years ago, these were all about chaos, finding beauty in, in chaos and were related to my mother's passing and really trying to weave in as we look at people's lives. Now, I apparently have got these on automatic, but uh, let me see if I can go back around. Sorry, everyone. But the images I just showed you with my mother, uh, those chaotic images trying to weave and find things of beauty were really about um, looking the way we look at things right and and finding um beauty in in things that seem chaotic that they're there and so in some ways these works that i just uh shared with you well, well john shared and then these kind of link in that that setting these are a series that many of you are familiar with i'll just go with the timing uh they kind of deal with the finding structure out of the chaotic elements in our life so similarly and these are ones I've been doing for the last two or three years, uh, a series called The Weight We Carry. Um, if you went to the show Written Vision uh, earlier this year, uh, these were all images from that. But the whole idea of trying to find structure with, and balance and equilibrium through difficult times. And that would be kind of a common, uh, common theme that I've always tried to work on in the last 10 years is how do you find equilibrium and balance in, in the storm and the chaotic moments of our lives and try to find some semblance of order and beauty. Um, this is a, these are from a series that are more metaphorical, uh, 30 by 22 full sheet uh, printing paper. My background is in printmaking. My MFA is uh, in printmaking from the University of Arizona. And uh, John talked about me always drawing. My, my BFA from BYU is in drawing which they no longer offer. But so yeah, I think you can see that my, my paintings that I showed you the first three are oil paintings are very printerly and that these uh, prints are kind of more painterly. Monotype prints tend to feel that way um, and there's layering. But I also have been dealing with a lot of images and uh, dealing with the spiritual realm and the, the physical realm and trying to find that inner balance and that struggle. This is a piece that was in the uh, international church show uh, uh, two years or a year ago for two years and deals with I and Thou, a uh, nod to um, Bubner, Buber's uh, book by the same name, Martin Buber. Anyway, 
So a lot of, I like playing with metaphors, trying to find individual meaning, but hopefully the images resonate with other people that they try to find some sense of filling up and understanding that, that balance between the spirit, uh, spiritual side of us and the physical. That's fantastic. So kind of a similar question to what I asked mm -hmm. John, um, what kind of motivates you in your work? And with that, like even your work outside of the visual art that you're creating, because you're involved in lots of different types of mm -hmm. work in the art industry and, and you're always doing something like what keeps you motivated to be involved in all those things? Well, you know, yeah, I, sometimes things just come upon you in a very organic, natural way. I never intended to become a high school art teacher, but that's what happened. I, I never intended to be involved with a lot of national organizations, but it somehow just organically spun out. And as you start to have things grow, they just kind of take you in different directions. The one area where I like to have my own kind of, I, the creative constraints are less constraining are in my studio. And uh, going in there and making imagery that means something to me as I struggled to find uh, my individual path. This was a uh, work that was just purchased by the state of Utah, part of their collection. And, and uh, you know, it really is a symbolic uh, sense of kind of a journeying, trying to find meaning and understanding and finding uh, equilibrium and balance. So that is a common theme throughout all my work, no matter the scale uh, or, or imagery, it's a common thing. This is one I did for the UVU faculty show uh, obviously a nod to COVID and, um, and some work right now that is not all the way finished, but was, is going to be for the show John and I are going to have at the Woodbury Museum. It'll be digital on, uh, in January, but uh, these are some very large works dealing with uh, similar kind of themes of, of ritual becoming sacrifice, coming to you know no, no oneself, I guess. Very cool. So now I guess just some questions kind of for both of you and how you've grown together and the things that you've done differently and the things that you've done the same. So you two were raised in the same house, but you're very much different people. So what do even you think the you same room for a while? Yeah, yeah, even the same room. Well, what's different, Haley, is I can I can I can say that I'm smarter and more handsome, as you can see. <laughs> Clearly, so um, let's just get that. Let's well. just get that itchy question <laughs> right out of the bag. So, apart from that, though, I probably is what you really mean to say, Haley. Uh, I mean, <laughs> that one's a different question, but let's just make that clear and distinct right now. Yeah, and John, as you he's eloquently uh, expressed, is delusional and and really has a hard time seeing reality. But uh, you know, what's funny is we actually. I'm not the one wearing bedroom. glasses. <laughs> Um, it's a good point. Um, we shared a bedroom at one point and we fought and actually delineate, we, we, with masking tape separated the room. That was uh, sweet. So, yeah, that's, yeah, true. yeah, that's true. John had the door side, but I had the black and white TV that I angled so he couldn't see it. So, you know, there's ways that, that, that is true. We, we, there was literally tape down the middle of the room. Yeah. Yeah, I think every sibling that shared a room has done that. I know me and my sister definitely. Oh, did, did you? That. Okay. Uh -huh. And thinking oh, about good. that, so this is this is a question. I don't know if this has ever been something that's been a part of your life, but me and my sister, we're quite competitive, and so I'm wondering, has competition kind of ever played a motivator in either of you with your work, kind of in helping each other kind of keep going? Has competition ever been a part of that, or not really? Well, I don't view myself as competition. What do you mean? Because by that? Be, because I'm clearly the better artist. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, you know. Um, I so for those of you who know us, if you didn't expect banter, you're in the wrong channel. Yeah. So the the reality is, I'll answer it more seriously. Uh, is I I've never seen. Well, I don't think we've seen us uh, each other as like we're trying to compete against each other. But I have been inspired to John early on, especially that his work, he's really uh, had a good foothold on in the aesthetic realm with photography. He's done really great things. And that was always very impressive. So some points I was always trying to keep up with John and hopefully it's some, that shifted some points. I don't know, maybe, maybe in other work, maybe in teaching, John's been trying to play catch up, but he was in the, the, the advertising world for so long uh, that he kind of entered into the teaching thing a little a bit later than I did. 
Yeah, I mean, yeah. Jim, Jim, I mean, on, on my part, Jamie's always been exceptionally good at what he does. So, I, I mean, th the real answer to that would be, yeah. I mean, there, there's always been competition. I mean, I, and just in terms of, I don't know if it's competition as much as a mutual support of the work that we were doing, because the work we were doing is different. You know, yeah. I mean, I, I think, so, you know, so in high school, I, 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 in my sophomore year, I got a scholarship to interlock in School of the Arts for a drawing that I did it, on, on uh, it was a charcoal drawing. And I didn't, I, truthfully, I didn't make that much effort into it. And, and it was our mom that always forced us to enter into these things, getting back to Jamie's point. I never gave it much thought, but my mom did it. Next thing you know, I had a scholarship offer. I'm like, that's crazy. I'm not really somebody who can, I, I don't consider myself a drawer necessarily. It's all that good. Painting is stuff I liked, but, but anyway, I, I think it was more of just being in the household. You, you're there and you know, you're, you're self-aware of what everybody's doing, but it's, it was compartmentalized at the same time. I don't, does it make sense? You know, I, I, I think I remember an episode that kind of, we came to understand that we both were artistic, creative people, but our methods were completely different as our personalities are very different. Do you remember when we were, you were commissioned to do something for the Utah Arts Festival uh, installation on a car? Oh yeah, that And was, you invited that was me to collaborate with you. It was terrible. During this time, we were fighting during the process and it, and it wasn't that we were, we, we just didn't work in the same way. Uh, John likes to kind of organically play around and have things happen. I like to have kind of a preliminary idea of where we're going. And I remembered that and we were both frustrated with each other. And I think we came to realize, well, we just work differently. And so collaboration is generally not a good idea. In fact, in the exhibit, when it physically gets up, what we'll, we'll see in, in the Woodbury, you'll see one side of the museum, his work and one side mine, and they're literally going to be facing each other to, and I think what will be interesting with that, you'll be able to, as people go through that, if you can visualize that, you'll see the images playing off of each other. And I think the viewers will maybe see some commonalities, but you'll certainly see the differences as well. So that's the kind of layout we, we have in mind for the, uh, the in-person, in real life uh, show. And so it, it, it accentuates that difference, that creative energy that I think we have some commonalities. Uh, John, John really works a lot with kind of the chaos theory and that image, uh, the, the later work. And, and I play off of trying to find structure out of chaotic elements in our lives. So I think there's some commonality, even yeah. though we express in different ways. I, I, will, I will say this, and I, and I feel bad for the Utah Arts Council because that was a terrible thing. Um, but It was but, all your fault, by the way. So, 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 my re so here's what I got to, here's what I want to clarify though, is in my commercial world, it is such a point of, I have to deliver a set of imagery that is meeting a specific need, right? So there's boundaries. I, there's a lot of money at stake. I mean, I, I've done photo shoots that the budget just for production is $100,000, right? Just for the production of the shoot. That's not including anything else. So, so I have to be very controlled and very centered on getting those outcomes with those parameters. So when I'm doing work that's selfish for me in the fine art world, I'm, I'm the exact opposite person. I'm much more mm. exploratory with what I'm able to produce versus what I'm paid to produce, right? Like it, it's like movie production set. You, you've got all these people who are doing their work. I've got lighting crew. I've got three assistants. I have catering. I've got all these things and everything I'm accountable for. So there's a lot of pressure, but for myself, I'm more selfish. And I throw all that out the door and do the exact opposite. So I guess I'm maybe that's a little bit schizophrenic now that I think about it. No, but I think it makes a lot of sense though that your process kind of changes depending on the type of work that you're involved in. I think it makes yeah. a ton of sense. So, so I'm only that way really with um, um, my own, my, my selfish work anyway. Like that Camilla really actually cool. said, humble brags, John. Thanks, Camilla. <laughs> <laughs> Good to so see you, Camilla, thing, by the way. The next thing I actually wanted to ask you guys about is teaching, because you both teach in different capacities. And I know that um, you're both fantastic teachers. I know that both from experience and just from things I've heard about both of you. But how does teaching 
kind of intersect or influence your professional and personal work? Has teaching really had an influence on the work that you create? Oh yeah, because I can steal all my students' work. They're, they're so brilliant. <laughs> I, 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 you know, that's my, like, like truthfully, um, what, what I like about the teaching in terms of influence me, like obviously I don't steal the students' work, but I, I really thrive off of the energy of the students and their explorations. And they constantly surprise me. And that gives me such amazing energy. Like, like in all honesty, I mean, most, if anybody's ever taught, I see my, my fine friends, the Vistanas in the corner. Hi, Steve, hi, Tanya. Um, love them. The, the thing that for me that I get out of them, and I, Steve can actually attest to this too, is that Look, the pay sucks. There's, there's no doubt about that. The pay isn't that great. Nobody's in the profession of teaching for pay. Um, but what I get in return from my students, like I, I saw that Shaylee's here over there on the iPad and stuff, the energy that they give me and their curiosity and um, what they bring and deliver makes me so damn happy. Like it really does. And I like, you know, I, I, I yeah, I, yeah, and I try not to agree with John too much, but I, I would agree that there's a certain amount of energy that comes by, you know, for me, I really have seen uh, things flow, the energy that flows from the classroom into my studio, and also my studio, things happen that I will carry over into the classroom, and so the ebb and flow of the two places and trying to have maintain that kind of creative energy, but I, I am always amazed at what students can do. And I think if they're given the right environment, students are very capable, uh, you know, doing some really wonderful things and being part of that, being witness to that is really exciting. Uh, John and I both have some people that are in here, uh, Camilla and other people, Haley, former students of ours, and it's just so rewarding to see how people take uh, what you have tried to do and take it in their own way and they really accentuate their own voice and, and and become their own person. And that's really rewarding to see them find their own, their own, they cut their own teeth in their own own way in their creative, you know, en endeavors. Yeah, I mean, it, it just feeds my, uh, honestly, it feeds my soul. And most of you question as to whether or not I have one. I, I was gonna that. say that, John, yeah. soul, I mean, I, that's I, theoretical. I question that, I, it might have, you know, boy, it, there's, you know, different types of entities there, but, you know, I like, it, it's just, if you haven't done it before, it's hard to express. It really is. Um, I fell into teaching. I never was going to be a teacher. That never happened. I came to teaching by way of a, when it was UVSC, there was a, there was a faculty member there who called John Telford, rest his soul, he passed away not that long ago, at BYU and asked if there's anybody he thought that would be a good person to teach at UVSC. And they were so desperate, they called me up and they gave me the job on the spot when I actually did it. And I, I, it was never on my radar. And so I was commercial photographer at the time, working really heavily, so we came to an agreement. I said, if I have a gig, you're gonna find a substitute for me. And they said, yeah, whatever you want. And so, in fact, the first week that I taught there, I'd already booked a cruise to the Bahamas. So I didn't even show up the first week of school. You know, yeah. so all these crazy things, but I'm glad that that opportunity presented itself because I would have, it would never have been on my radar. I never went to school thinking it was going to be a, a teacher. Never, well, ever, ever. And, and to be honest, I, I didn't either. I did not get a teaching degree. I, I uh, got my BFA and my MFA, and then through an interesting series, got a, a degree directly from the state without having to go through college. But uh, that's an unusual circumstance. But yeah, it, it was something that just kind of presented itself. And I'm really glad I did because you get to meet some fantastic people, right, Haley? Yeah, absolutely. The coolest. <laughs> awesome. So I have just like one more question for you guys, okay. and then we will turn it over for Q&A um, for anyone to ask questions to either of you. So as we're doing that, if you guys have questions right now, feel free to start dropping them into that chat. We'll get those answered very soon. Um, but what is the thing you admire the most about each other? And James, I'll yeah. ask you first. What's the okay. thing you admire the most about John? I think it's John. <laughs> I think it's John's hairstyle. I mean, I, I've been trying to emulate that for years, and no, honestly, John has a, a great uh, endeavor. He he's he's a hundred percent in in everything he does that is aesthetic, where he lives, how he lives. Uh, 
everything he does is, is very intentional and uh, really revolves in and around the arts. I mean, he's really, he's all in and I've always admired that. Oh, that's super sweet. I'm gonna get all teared up and verklempt. <laughs> Uh, what I'll, I'll say what I've admired the most about Jamie is the fact that he, I mean, I know he's an exceptional teacher and he, it, it, by way of students like you, Haley, you know, I, it, he, he will go in and the fact that he's able to, has been able to, and still able to um, have an impact on the arts, not just on a local level, but on a national level, which is super duper impressive. I mean, I, I'm constantly impressed with all of the talent that we have here in Utah and to have my brother I, and, and, you know, and I'm proud to say this, who is been a representative under Michelle Obama, right? Did you guys know that? For arts and humanities? I mean, holy crap. That's, that's amazeballs. We, we, we used to go golfing. Okay. That's not true. So, so um, you, you know, that kind of stuff and, and, and the people that he's been able to, put utah on the radar and and help us out from washington dc to here that's huge that is huge right and so i often think that you know it, you're not a prophet in your own you know land type of thing right i know i know a, a few of you are going to go wait john's speaking scriptorially i know that's also <laughs> a problem i get that i get that blessed for i have sinned something 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 but um that the fact of the matter is we've got such great talent in Utah that often is taken for granted. And I definitely think that my brother is one of those people. And, 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 oh, that's you really know, nice, John. you know, I mean, Jamie it, and I is are it the oil... fact that Christmas is coming up. Is this... You got me a Christmas present last year. No, what I'm saying, I must are you have saying missed, this because I must have Christmas missed that. Is coming? I yeah. sent you a Christmas present. Bam, yeah. my, so, so, much. So, so by the way, if you don't know this, I, just shout out, my brother's birthday month is coming up. <laughs> so if you don't know this, Jamie doesn't have a birthday. He used to have a birthday week, but a pretty well thing that he extended into the month. And Muddy Bell can actually attest to this. So <laughs> if you know, if you want to get something for Jamie's birthday month, it's in December. That's all you got to know. Yeah. It's all month. Well, John's getting me a couple of his photographs because, you know, I just realized I don't have a couple of his images in my collection. Yeah, and you got to get kind of, that. Yeah, I mean, how, how do I not have a John Reese? I have older John Reese's. I don't have current John Reese's in my collection. That That's really, really sad. That yeah, is. Perfect. Well, we're going to start taking some questions. Again, if you guys have questions, go ahead and drop them in the chat. But Shaylee asked, um, is there a time or times where you felt like you were stuck in a lull? How did you pull out of that? What did you do to feel like you were getting moving forward again? And I think that's a pretty good question for a lot of people right now who are stuck at home and maybe you're not feeling as inspired. So how do you guys handle that kind of thing? I talk to my, my former student, Shaylee and, and Nate over there and say, hey, how's it going? I, you know, for me, I, I so I, these are difficult times for myself. Music is a huge part of my life. I'm, I've been, I, listen, I started going to bands when I was in grade school. Like I, I'm, I'm, and I see Steve is done over there nodding. I probably have seen more bands just in my short grade school years than most people have seen in their lifetime. And, and that might seem like an exaggeration, but I mean, it, it's probably not. So music for me is the thing that motivates me. Also, and that I'm a photographer, I like photographers, but I also like looking at other artists. So when I'm in a lull, I'll put some music on and I'll look out and see what interesting, cool things are happening in the art world. So that that's what I do for me. The other thing that I'll do is if I'm not, if I don't think what I'm doing creatively is feeding my soul and I, and I don't like what it is just from a, a gut reaction, I'll go try to experiment with some music really badly. Steve can attest to this, but um that but, it's all but bad. I, the, my, I, I'm not a musician, but I like to tweak with buttons and stuff. Steve's a musician. Yeah, um, Steve's awesome. So, so I like to, I, I love music though. So, you know, all these things I think feed your soul. So I don't know if that's a good answer, well, but there's other venues yeah. that can loop into your creative energy based upon what you consume, right? You are what you consume. Good well, food, good friends, good family. And fortunately, I've got awesome friends. Yeah. I mean, my, my friends are the best. 
Well, um, I, let me say, I, I do something um, that seems very unconventional, something that I do to kind of buffer the day in and day out is I, I, I exercise does it for me, the endorphins. I go biking for an hour, an hour and a half each day. And what I think that does, and I don't, it doesn't need to be biking. What it does, it's kind of, uh, it helps me not to think about anything for a while. And, and it just kind of clears the cobwebs away that when I go into the studio after a bike ride, my mind's, and, and I'm kind of clear, I'm clean and I feel like I'm kind of open. You know, my subconscious is a little more accessible because I've just worked out for an hour, an hour and a half. And so, you know, I'm kind of in a good place to be receptive. And the other thing I do is I work on multiple works at the same time, uh, because inevitably that one work will shut the door and you won't know what to do. You, the one next to it or the one over here may, may uh, speak to you and you may have some answers, you know, to, to be able to entertain where that might go. That's fantastic. So we had another question come in from Grady that I thought was kind of fun. And they asked, if you taught elementary school, what assignment would you give? Advice for an elementary school teacher. Well, you know, it's interesting. I've had a, a lot of debates with elementary school teachers because, you know, traditionally uh, the very crafty kind of things that we associate with elementary school is, is you know, like the, the, the turkey during Thanksgiving, right? And we always do that. What, what, whatever I would do is, is uh, really let you, what I did with our kids, we homeschooled, my wife homeschooled, I guess I was supportive of that, to be honest. And we really believed in exposing them to a lot of artwork and, and then letting them kind of explore with medium and having a lot of good materials around. And so I still kind of think that with some very wide constraints, younger, is good for them to explore. So I would find some assignments where they play around with color, expression, color mixing, but not so uh, formulaic like we often do. I think the younger kids just need to really explore and investigate through material. So grade school was the question, Haley, is that right? Elementary school. Yeah, elementary, elementary yeah. school. So I guess that depends, it's a big gamut. So um, I can't speak to that all that well because in all truthfulness, I did really good grades in junior high and high school, graduated with a 3.96, but in grade school, I almost got kicked pill. out. You I almost got pill. kicked out. Like a few you times. You the lunch lady. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> I, that's true. You th told this potty case. mouth has yeah. gone a long way and, and I feel bad. I mean, who, who tells the lunch lady that her quiche tastes like shit? This is what John said in elementary school. This is word. Yeah, this what? Is what? You, okay, we're gonna we're gonna pull that out already. Oh, <laughs> man, I'm sorry. That lunch. You day, brought it yeah. up. You brought it up. No, I just I didn't say that. You you, you did too. detailed you it. Did too. You uh, okay, did so I, too. Fine, fine. So <laughs> I will say this though. I'm getting back. <laughs> I feel like the gloves are out now. I, I can I can start talking about Jamie's high just school. Just be careful, career, you so. guys. There's kids present. Yeah. yeah okay, John. So I hey, I wasn't the one that used that. The, the potty language over here. Uh, so so I wasn't the best grade school kid. I, I was put into uh, classes <laughs> because I, I'm interested in a lot of different things. I mean, my students can attest to this, that I, I teach in a circular method. I will go one way and come back only when a student brings me back on course, truthfully. <laughs> So not unlike what we're talking about today. So what I can say is getting back to what Jamie said, my favorite art piece in the entire world was created by my son when I was living in Austin. I would go get some two feet by two feet um, masonite boards in the backyard and we would just paint together. So I have a piece that's a collaboration between myself and Roman that's hanging in my office and I love it. There was nothing that was guided other than here's some paint do whatever you want to do on this format and not a small little eight by ten a big format because that gives less restrictions so I think I'd approach grade school something like that it, rather than the lines you know let's paint and something like this is how you do that because those aren't really conducive to the idea of creativity they're conducive that most of the assignments that we got is in grade school were conducive to the idea of fitting within the format of the norm, 
not figuring out what your brain wants to do. Right? Yeah, and, and not thinking like an artist, right? It wasn't really about exploration and Well, it's not even self-expression, right? No. Like no. I, I, I even remember getting, I, 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 there was a thing that I did where I drew outside of the lines and I was, I didn't get good marks for that because I didn't draw within the confines of what I was supposed to draw in. So, yeah. I, you know. Well, in, el I, anyway. in elementary school, you get, if you don't, if it's, not, it's about conformity, isn't it? And, and assignments that are about coloring within the lines about reinforcing conformity. I remember in fourth grade getting in trouble for writing, if you know, on a uh, paper, the line paper, where the holes are, there's that other side of the line. I, I, I would draw and doodle in there and I would do the assignment, but I got in trouble because it wasn't conforming to the standard of whatever arbitrary rule they'd yeah. established for note taking. That's interesting. I did the same things in hymn books. But you did the little flippy things where like people yeah. were like ski jumping or motorcycles. Yeah, I mean, you know, that's everybody knows the different. words. We've got to make it a little bit more visual. I mean, yeah. and there's a good canon within, you know, scriptures where you can actually start to embellish things anyway. I mean, that's been happening for a long time. So I figured I'd, I'd put my work there too, you know. So anyway, St Steve and Tanya do it within their own sketchbooks at church, I see. Yeah, um, that's probably a little bit better. But hey, if you run out of paper, Steve, go ahead and feel free to take a hymn book. I'm giving you permission. <laughs> I think we have six minutes left, right, Haley? Yeah, but thank we you for that question, Green. That was yeah. a good one. <laughs> um, but yeah, so we've got a few minutes left. So if anybody has a question, you can go ahead and drop it into the chat, or you can go ahead and unmute yourself and just ask. Um, but we do have a little. Come on, bit Camilla. More. Guys, can I say Camilla's got the coolest hairdo and always has? And I met she Camilla has. by way of my brother, and we did a photo <laughs> shoot together a long time ago which was still fantastic. So thank you. It's great to see you, Camilla. Great to see you too. I'm in the middle of dyeing my hair, so I'm going to keep my camera oh. right now. <laughs> yeah. And Camilla's artwork is image. awesome. Cam yeah, Camilla's artwork fantastic is just fantastic. Um, on, Steve, do you have anything to rile up uh, the how do, you, how do you feel? Because you've been in the same community for basically your entire lives. How do you feel that changes your work compared to so many artists who, um, you know, become like multi-city or multi-resident artists. Such as yourself, Camilla, right? Yeah, I mean, I grew up in Provo <laughs> too, but then I moved to Los Angeles. Yeah. Well, I, I actually, I don't know if you know this, but I actually was living in Austin for seven years prior to coming back to teach. So I was in Austin and then I used to spend my summers in St. Petersburg, Russia, because my former spouse and I, we had a place there till just this year in downtown St. Petersburg. So, um, but it is a good question because, you know, you get, you, I think uh, what might be implied is typically you have a very narrow view because your perspective comes from one geographic point, right? But, uh, you know, we, we're blessed with so many opportunities. I, I travel quite a lot um, and a lot of the work that I do requires me to travel all over the world. And so even though it's not living there full time, which is, it is different, no, no doubt. But uh, by traveling all the way, like I've gone all over, um, and as John has traveled a lot too, you, you get a different perspective. And especially with most of the work I do is connecting with art um, educators or artists. Um, you know, it's a way to kind of broaden your perspective. Yeah, I know you weren't implying anything negative, uh, Camilla. Um, I, I do think though it is interesting, right? Because you, your involvement within an arts community can be very different. Um, my experience at, uh, in Tucson when I lived there was a very different art culture than what we have here in Utah. Not not better or worse, just different. And that that's that's part of the the beauty of traveling or living somewhere else. It gives you a wider perspective. Yeah, and and for me, for myself, I traveled extensively, especially for both work and pleasure. So. Yeah, I I think that definitely has informed a different perspective of the world. I think, I. I personally believe a lot of the problems and the schisms that we are having as a country right now, not to get too political, could be easily resolved if people went and actually met other people from other countries and really were more empathetic to what's happening versus our myopic perspective. And I think maybe that's what Camilla is talking about. I mean, if, you're, yeah. if your own world only was within your world, you don't know any better, right? Just by well, default. And also 
and and also she may be implying or or, or wanting us to discuss because if you are around a certain group of artists within a geographic locale that there there are influences that you know formal properties that find their ways into your work or can subconsciously become part of your way of working or i mean the way you two have known each other your entire life you have neighbors probably who you've seen them working nearly their entire life too and you've grown up as artists together so you have those longer relationships because of that um, you know, just being in a split, in a place much longer. Mm. Yeah, that's that's true. Yeah, but but the other part for me is the work that I do. I try to broadcast it to like the competitions I I send my work to are like international and national competitions, and I also participate locally. So I have to think of my work not only being representative of our local geography, because ultimately the goal, as you know, is to get your work seen by as many people as possible so that the birds of a feather, the people who like what you do, start to appreciate your language as a visual artist. And, and you know, birds of a feather flock together, absolutely, you know? So I, I don't know, that's probably a terrible answer. Sorry, Camilla. I, I'm just fixated with the birds and their feathers. I mean, <laughs> it's a really strong. Uh, I can see that it's coming through in your artwork. A lot of, lot of crows. A lot of lately. crows. Yeah, yeah, a lot of ravens, crows there lately. Ravens, nothing to crow yeah. about, Jamie. Just nothing to crow about. Or Sorry, nothing to raven bad. about. Yeah. <laughs> so I guess to finish off, since this is creative collaborative, uh, um, I guess my last question would just be, what's one piece of advice each of you have for how you are staying involved in the community right now, even though things are a little bit weird? Go, Jamie. Well, one thing I really, my artwork and the different areas that I do is about connecting. So I try to connect with many different people. I see Leslie Graff here uh, and her son, and I got to know her from another online event uh, three months ago. And so I'm trying to connect with people in so many different ways, uh, not only with my art, but here online and, and sharing. So I'm trying to keep things communal and connecting uh, in any way I can, uh, art shows or in events like this. So that's one thing I've been doing. Well, there's that too. And I would give a shout out to Lisa Anderson um, from the Woodbury, who has done a very good job at making sure that artists are present and visible in the world right now that is a little bit tumultuous, but it looks like we might be hopefully coming out of it within eight months or to a year, if all things go well. But, um, you know, for myself, I'm fortunate getting back to my students. Um, I'm able to thrive off of what they're doing. Like today, I had some beautiful work for an assignment that I gave them. Most of the assignments that I give them are real world concepts based from my experience. Um, so collaboratively, I, I'm also engaging in international works right now. I just got noticed today that I'm a finalist for the International Black and White Spider Awards, second time, which is which is pretty cool. It's cool. and it's and that's judged by you know sell the bees and some pretty heavy hitters. So um, I'm I'm applying to those sort of things. So again, getting back to local work as well as national and international competitions. So um, that's that's what I'm doing. But that's no different than what I'd be doing anyway. The only thing that's different is I can't hang out with my cool friends and go to concerts like honestly that's what i miss and my son like tanya's over there going yeah absolutely mm -hmm. you know music feeds my soul and it just makes me so happy um so my, my son's living in austin still so that that's something that i wish i could reconnect with that's that's my heart and soul for those of you who know roman's my my everything and um i've got an amazing supportive spouse so i, I yeah i don't know i'm just really looking forward to the other end of that in the meantime, I think all the things I mentioned about what we do as artists, both for ourselves and for others, is probably the most important thing that we can contribute as artists. So again, that probably didn't answer your question either, Haley. I'm so sorry. Oh, perfect. No, this has been <laughs> So thank you guys again so much. Blah, for blah, coming blah, for blah, 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 blah. <laughs> Thanks, Haley. But before we finish off, can you guys just let us know where people can find you? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I had a slide for that. My, my website is jamesreesart.com and you can find me on Instagram, james underscore Reese. And I, as I said, yeah. you can find my work at uh, the Covey Center Monday through next Monday through the end of the month and up at Inline Cafe right now. 
Yeah. I have a website that's actually not live that I'm building right now of my newer work, actually two different websites, but my old website is filmstill.com or johnreese.com will also redirect you into that. There's no E on the end, as you can tell. Um, and on Instagram is John Reese photo, but that's private. So just ping me and say, Hey, whatever. And then, and, there, and it's just private because mostly I use it as a sketchbook for ideas. Sometimes I'll show work out there. Um, of progress, like works in progress, but also older works at times. Um, and I communicate with other people that that I admire and love and adore, like um, Sandy Skolgan and I have been going back and forth with things and super fortunate to have a relationship with her. So, um, but if you're interested at all to see just my stream of consciousness work, just ping me and you can do that. That's fine too. Perfect. Well, thank you again for all your awesome words that you shared with us. Thanks for taking the time to tell us about your experiences. It's and so great to so see much. these lovely people too. Yeah, my thank fine you so friends. much. We appreciate wintering out. And thank you, Heidi. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks for everyone who came. Good to see you, Nate <laughs> and Shaylee and Steve. And I feel like I'm at a talk show. I see Lisa. I see Laura. That, that's showing your age. No one else. Exactly. That I know. Miss Julie. Miss Julie. Yeah. Some of these people are going to remember Miss Julie. Not too many, John. Yeah. I Not see. Not too many. I see Steve has a birthday coming. Oh, wait. Steve and Tanya had their birthday just recently in October. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. You, you may want to cut the recording at this point. John's going to go on. I don't think I can end no, it. No. I don't think I can. <laughs> um, but also just, just as a housekeeper. Mute Jamie. Can I do that? Um, to nope, thank you, you guys so much control. for doing this. If you've enjoyed this, uh, everyone that's been here, um, if you can always share on Instagram that you had a good time tonight, let people know what's going on. Let people know about these events. It really helps. Um, we are going to have another live studio tour next week with somebody to be determined. We have a few people that are kind of on the radar, but those are happening. Um, if you ever know of any other events going on, please send us a message on the Creative Collaborative Instagram. We'd love to help get the word out. But thank you for everyone who came. Yeah. Tanya, thanks for wearing the Amoeba shirt. <laughs>